Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Leonardo Ortega, uh, Research Director for the National Mango Board, and I will be moderating this webinar. To get us started on the discussion related to the ABCs of the final standard for traceability, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Sergio Nieto Montenegro. Many of you know Dr. Nieto. He has been working with the National Mango Board since 2012. At that time, we conducted an industry-wide food safety assessment in the main mango exporting countries that send product to the US. He has a doctorate in food sciences from Penn State University in the US. He specializes in food safety as well as converting scientific and technical information into simple language that any person can understand. As I mentioned previously, we've been working with Dr. Montenegro since 2012. He's extremely experienced both at the farming and packing house level, and he has extensive experience in storage facility management as well. In addition to working with the mango board, he also works with other different uh, products such as avocados, leafy greens, and other types of produce. He's a, a person who is widely known and highly regarded for his experience and knowledge. With that, I will yield the floor to Dr. Sergio Montenegro. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to be here once again. It's been some time since we've had a webinar such as this, but we are back here all together, and I hope to be able to see you at a future extension meeting in an in in-person format. So let's talk a little about, about the traceability standards and the traceability record requirements, uh, some additional ones that have been added to the standard. And I'd like to focus this discussion solely on fresh mangoes. There could be people from other industries that could uh, learn a lot about this standard, but I'm going to focus today's webinar on fresh mangoes. First, uh, I want to share this disclaimer. Everything that I discuss here is something that I do for myself. I don't do it on behalf of the National Mango Board, nor do I do it on behalf of any regulatory agency. I can't tell you whether or not you're in compliance of standards because I don't work for a regulatory agency and I don't work on behalf of any regulatory agency. So now that we understand ourselves, each other through the Q&A, I'd like to now ask in a very simple sentence, to you, what is traceability? How do you define traceability? All of the history of a product that, that is supported by documentation. Our good friend from Buda wrote that. Having a record from the moment the product is harvested until it gets to its final destination. Follow up for the mango product from origin all the way to the destination. Series of procedures that allows for the process of following the evolution of a product along the supply chain. And these are all good answers, but let's get to a definition that I came up with. What is traceability? And a lot of what appears here on the screen really coincides with what you answered in the Q&A. It's a series of procedures that allow for the follow-up of the movement of a food product and its ingredients along every link in the supply chain, both moving forward and moving backward. So these are the procedures that will allow me to track the movement of a single unit of mango through every stage of the supply chain. I'll know where it comes from, where it gets packed, where it arrives with the importer, and then subsequently, if it's repacked or if it's conditioned in any way, or if after that it, it is transported to another warehouse and then subsequently to another warehouse, all of these procedures 
have to do with traceability? Now, let me ask you this. Why is it important for the supply chain to have traceability? Well, it's important for us to understand where the food that we eat comes from. And more precisely, it's important for us to know where the food comes from, especially if we have any kind of an issue. And knock on wood, we are not going to have that. But if we have an incident with contaminated food, then traceability capability allows us to undergo a very acute market analysis. So let's say it's January and I live in a small town in Wisconsin somewhere and we have a problem with mangoes there. And again, knock on wood, this is not gonna happen, but if I have a good idea of which packing house that product came from, that which farm that came from, then I could do all the causal analysis and then I could restrict any harm that the contaminated product could uh, cause in the market and contain any outbreak. But if I don't have any traceability, I will be forced to do a product recall with a much larger amount of product because I don't know where the contaminated product came from. So it's important for us to understand all of these issues related to the mango supply chain and how traceability can make it more effective. And let's talk about certain key elements of this standard. I need to have the capability of knowing where a mango came from whenever I find it in a retail store in River Fort, Wisconsin, or where have you. It could be, it could, I could get it all the way I could trace it back to the Tambo Grande or even Brazil or some farm in Esquinapa, Sinaloa. And that's what the traceability concept allows me to do. And among the things that I'm going to be discussing here, you, you I'll, I will be talking about things that are on the traceability website. Again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the National Mango Board or any regulatory agency. And I can't tell you whether or not you're in full compliance of the standards. For that purpose, you need to talk to your own legal department, but we can surely talk a little bit about all of this related to the new standard. What benefits does the standard offer us? Well, it'll help us restrict any foodborne diseases because we will be able to identify the contamination source more rapidly. We could conduct a more efficient and more rapid product recalls from the market. And so if I look at a product and I have all my traceability system in place, I may want to know that as a shipper, I could determine where I sent my mangoes. I might have sent some to Minnesota, some to Wisconsin or some other locations. And from a particular lot, I'm just going to conduct a product recall in those three or four places and not in 20 or 30 cities that received mangoes from me. And so these are the benefits that we're looking to achieve through the implementation of the standard, less foodborne diseases, because you can identify the source and the origin of a food product more quickly. Another benefit derived from the standard is that it allows us to harmonize these standards throughout the supply chain. And I've already talked about identification of the issue of the origin or source, more effective, more rapid product recalls, but we can also do more effective analysis to look at the causal elements behind the, the problem. So let's look at other benefits that the traceability standard is imposing regarding additional records that certain food products need to have. This is one of my favorite slides among all my presentations because this slide tells us in a summarized way what we all need to do and the traceability standard for food requires that people that produce process pack or store food products included in the food traceability list maintain and provide their supply chain partners specific information related to certain critical events in the tracking along the supply chain. 
so I'm including all of the acronyms he, here, but what the standard says is that if you produce, process, pack, or store any food product that is listed with the FDA, then you will have to be able to share information with everybody that participates along that supply chain. And you're going to have to collect certain key data elements that occur during certain critical tracking or tracing events. So in certain stages of the supply chain, we have these certain critical traceability events, and these need to be documented and you need to be able to share those elements of information with everybody else on the supply chain. So again, if you produce, process, pack, or store food of any sort, especially of the kind that's listed with FDA, you need to be able to maintain, keep, and share information to your partners along the supply chain. So I need to be able to get a request for information with, say, a packing house operator, and I need to be able to share that information. I may want some information from a packing house, but I'll, I may have to provide it to the next link in the downstream of the supply chain. So the other issue I wanted to talk to you is who is subject to this standard? The people that need to be subject to this standard are the people that produce, process, pack, or store food products that are listed in the FDA food list. So if we go back to the prior concept, and I highlighted these in green, and let me use another color here. I don't like the red color, but I noted a few acronyms here, and I'm going to be referring to these acronyms throughout the course of this presentation. Additionally, we're going to be talking about the definition of each one. So if you produce, process, pack, or store food products, that are contained in the food traceability list with FDA, you will have the mandatory requirement to maintain additional traceability records in conformance with FSMA section 204. Now this new standard only applies to this food traceability list. And on the next slide, I will tell you what the list is, or maybe not in the next slide, but it'll be coming up in the next few slides. So if you are subject to complying with the standards, you will have to keep additional traceability records. And this applies to both domestic and foreign companies. And the deadline for compliance is January 20th of 2026. So you still have three years to get this system in place, but it's important for us to get started with the work we're gonna have to do from the outset as soon as possible. This may sound very simple, but I can assure you that, for example, there are packing houses that have thousands of product suppliers. So those operations will need to start working right away on getting all of the information that will allow them to be in full compliance with the standard by the deadline. So all supply chains are subject to the standard all the way from or ranging from the farm operations as well as facilities to retail outlets, both at the domestic and foreign level. And as long as you produce, process, pack, or store a food product that's contained or that's listed in the food traceability list, you need to mandatorily comply with this standard. There are differentiated requirements in accordance with the role or function of the entity that's part of the supply chain. Now, I've said this many times, depending on the activity or the function that you may have in the supply chain, you will have certain information requirements that you will need to maintain and share. Companies that carry out certain types of events will have to establish and keep records that contain certain specific information. And why am I talking about this in this way? Certain information, some records. The reason is that I'm going from the very broad and general to the more specific. We're starting with what is traceability? Why is traceability important? Who is subject to the new standard? Okay. And of course, like in all standards, 
there are certain exemptions and partial exemptions. There are a number of exemptions, but I'm going to focus on those that have to do specifically with our industry. Certain small agricultural product farms. I'm not going to talk really very much about exemptions. We could dedicate a two hour webinar to that topic, but I will share with you a tool that will allow you to easily access the list of exemptions. There's information available for you to research the exemptions that uh, may be applicable to you, and you can find them on this website, collaboration.fda.gov. I separated a, a number of websites here to show you how this works. You are looking at my website, correct? Please answer me to verify. Can you see my website here? Yes, we can. Very good. Thank you, Leo. So you can get on this website and you'll be answering certain questions. And you can just go through the website, navigate through it by answering yes or no questions, yes or no, yes or no. And depending on your answers, it'll tell you whether that exemption applies to you or your operation. So you could review this website to get a better understanding of whether or not you are qualified to get an exemption. Now, I remember doing a webinar that had a number of importers and large distributors of uh, produce. And somebody said that when you have certain exemptions, this is going to lead to a nightmare in terms of managing our products and our operations. Our policy needs to be that everybody needs to comply with a certain subset of requirements. And that's something that I heard from an importer at one time. But it's it doesn't mean that you will be subject to that. The message that I want to convey to you today is that if we have an exemption available and we do get a regulatory exemption from the FDA, which is the regulatory authority in the US, that's one thing. But if my client asks me to follow with some additional elements that are contained in the standard, then that's a different matter. So many times the customer has a great deal of influence in the decision-making process for our respective businesses. I like to say that if my client asks me to paint the packing house blue, I'm going to ask, what tone of blue would you like, right? We need to consider this uh, and uh, keep things separate. There's the FDA authority and then there's the customer base. So anyway, for people who produce, who produce or process or pack or store food products, they need to determine which foods are included in the food traceability list. And this was developed by the FDA and to, to make that determination as to the food products that are included in the list, the FDA developed a risk categorization process. And what they did was assessed at different products and risks, like a green leafy, products are at high risk for E. coli and other diseases. And so they collected all of the pertinent information and developed the criteria necessary for categorizing these products in this model. And this is something that they underwent to determine whether or not to include a specific food product on the list or not. We can always talk at a later time how that development process took place. But in that website, you can see how the FDA came up with the food traceability list, how they came up with a risk categorization model to create this list. And it had to do with the information that existed at the time and some risk criteria that applies to food products that existed at the time. But what we're here to do here today is that we want to look at 
the products that are relevant to us. And these include the fruit of tropical trees, fresh fruit from tropical trees. Now, when the initial proposal for the standard came up, this was not included, but the FDA did clarify which food products were going to be included and not included in the list. And to get more information, I suggest you visit the FDA website, or you can always reach out to us uh, with an email and ask your questions. But for the purposes of this National Mango, Mo Mango Board webinar, we need to understand that fresh mangoes are part of the food traceability list issued and managed by FDA. And therefore, if your operation produces, processes, packs, or stores mangoes, you're going to be subject to this standard unless you get an exemption. And how can you find out if you're eligible for an exemption? Well, you can find out by visiting the website. So it's important to understand that in this case, we're talking about fresh products. So if a fresh food product that's included on the list is used in food items that include uh, several other ingredients, then because that one ingredient, in this case, fresh mangoes, is on the list and it's used for the production of salads, then that will still be subject to the standard. Now, if there's any change in the format of the food product, then it won't be covered by the standard. But in this case, you can have a dish, for example, that is made up of different ingredients, um, some of which could be subject to the standard, could be on the list. One example would be peanut butter. If you use peanut butter as an ingredient in, say, a cookie or one of these cookies that, that they produce now that starts with a cookie and then you put peanut butter on it and then put another cookie on it, then that particular cookie would be subject to the standard. Now, if you take the fresh mangoes and you convert that into a puree or some other format, then, then that form or that format of the mango will no longer be subject to the standard because it's no longer deemed to be a fresh project or a fresh product. I remind everyone that if you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A room. So what have we been able to see so far? What can we see so far? What is traceability? Why is traceability important? There's a summary of the definition of the standard. And I talked about certain activities that I conduct within the supply chain, I have to collect and maintain and share certain types of specific information, and I have to share it with the other links in the supply chain. I've said this a number of times. After that, we looked at the deadline and who is subject to the standard. We looked at something related to the exemptions, and we also looked at the food traceability list that is, uh, managed by the FDA. We've seen that the mango, fresh mangoes are included in that. So the information that companies need to collect, keep and share with other supply chain uh, partners uh, are subject to the standard depending on the type of activity. So for example, if I'm a packing house operator, I don't have the same requirements as an importer or a harvester or a farm operation. Each link on the supply chain will have to collect certain specific information that needs to be able to be shared at a later time. So the information that you need to collect and share with other supply chain partners will vary depending on the activity that you engage in with regard to mangoes. It could be from harvesting or producing the mangoes to the processing distribution and receiving of the mangoes at the target market. A central element of the proposed requirements is sharing the traceability lot codes for foods included on the list, the food traceability list, as well as the linking of this information with other information about the food product as it moves through the supply chain. 
So I'm going to explain this concept in, a, in very simple terms because this is another concept that I've added, traceability lock code. The rule, the rule requires that you generate a traceability lock co code only when you carry out certain activities. So we're, we'll see those a little later on. But one central element of the rule is that you're going to have to assign, record, and share that traceability lock code with different participants in the chain. And that lock code is going to allow you to identify certain information about the food product so that you can identify where it comes from and where it goes. This is really just about linking the information by lock code. So you generate a lock code that allows you to follow that food product, but for the purposes of the rule, the traceability lock code is only assigned at certain points in the supply chain. When you're the initial packer and when you transform that food. And we'll see that in a little bit. So there are two concepts that are key that I've already been talking about, this CTE and KDE, which are critical tracing events and key data elements. The key data elements required by the rule depend on the critical tracking event you may be carrying out. And uh, it makes me laugh because I think I said this already, I'm saying it uh, different ways. So there are certain critical tracing elements that are required when you carry out uh, certain activities. Why did I say it two different ways? Because I think that this is something that that is important. And if you understand this, you will be able to carry out your traceability plan very simply. So so you have to understand, what do I do in the supply chain? Well, I do X. I'm the grower. Okay. So as the grower, given that growing or harvesting is a critical event, okay, so that means I have to maintain this critical data element. So that indicates what information you have to collect and share. So here at this point in the presentation, I'm starting to talk about the different elements. At first, I was just saying certain activities. So if you do certain activities, you're going to have to collect certain information. Well, those certain activities are called critical tracing events, critical tracking events. And they indicate that you must collect this information, this, these key data elements. I hope that's clear. Uh, let me know in the Q&A. So before we go on to the next section, I'd like to make sure that, that I'm making sense before we go on to some definitions. Just say yes in the Q&A. So let's see, electronic records or paper records are allowed by the rule. In some cases, the FDA might request an electronic spreadsheet that is searchable. That is if there is any kind of public health threat or outbreak of foodborne illness. So I'm going to talk about this a little later as well. So the records have to be provided to the FDA within 24 hours when requested. So all of this, if you remember about the specific mango in River Falls, Wisconsin, all of this is going to allow me to identify where that mango, that specific mango came from, and also determine where there are more mangoes from that lot to be able to recall it, call them quickly and to prevent foodborne illness. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to knock wood again. It's just an example. So let's get into this. So we're going to look at these two concepts that I mentioned. Critical traffic tracking events, or CTE. In English, it's critical tracking event, so CTE. So I'm going to be using this acronym 
A critical tracking event is an event in the supply chain related to a food from harvest, cooling, initial packing of a raw agricultural product up until it is received on land, if shipped by sea, shipping, reception, or transformation. I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to take out the... Uh, vessel part so this has to do with the picking cooling initial packing shipping receipt or transformation of the food so this is an event all of these are events in the supply chain and the fda determined that the critical tracking events are these events so we're going to have one, two, three, four, or all, depending on our company. So I'd like to explain key data elements. This is the information that we have to have. It's very simple in Spanish. A critical tracking event is the, an activity that takes place in the supply chain. And key data elements are information or records, the records that are required or the information that, you, that my records must contain. So key data elements are the is the information that must be contained in my record. So I'm going to say it again. The key data, data elements required by the rule depend on the activity that you are carrying out. So here we go. When I mention a key data element, I'm referring to the information associated with a critical tracking event for which records must be established and maintained in accordance with this section. So these are the legal terms. And while well, I've been explaining it from the very general to the more specific. So if I carry out a CTE or a critical tracking event, I'm going to have to have records with AKDE, key data elements. So if I perform as a company or an entity, a critical tracking event, then I am going to have to have records with certain key data elements. It's that simple. So we're good up to now, right? So the KDE required by the rule depend on the CTEs performed. So I don't want you to worry about or think that you have to do a million things. No, you just have to do your part. But the records required by the rule for each CTE will have to contain and link the KDE to the traceability lot. So I'm always going to have to link this information to the traceability lot code. So let's look at an example using mangoes. So this here, when something, well, I'm gonna change the color. Something that I want you to see here is that the FDA named or determined certain critical tracking events differently from what we call them in the industry. In fact, there are certain critical tracking events that really don't even take place in the mango industry. They don't exist in the mango industry. For example, for the FDA, the critical tracking events are here, right? So here we can see them and down here, I have indicated the points where I have to have a key data element for a certain activity. But for example, it says, if you are a farm, you're not going to have certain KDEs. If you're a company that harvests product, you will have to have certain KDEs. But it's important to realize in our industry, it's not like other industry. Well, it may or may not be. 
you may hire someone to come and harvest your product. In some farms, they have their own employees who do the work of harvesting. So this part here is included. And also here, when you carry out the harvest, this part, which is cooling, does not exist in our industry. For leafy greens, there's the farmer, and then they hire a company who comes and harvests the product, the harvesting company, and then it's sent to a cooler where the product is cooled. And then after that, it is sent to a packing house or to a processor. So all of these activities do take place. And in our case, they may or not take, may take place or they may not take place. So that's where we really have to be careful and understand what applies to me and what does not apply to me. So it's very important to understand what the supply chain is like, how it's defined and what parts apply to me. If the part that I perform is a critical tracking event or not under the world under the rule and if it is what are the key data elements that i'm going to have to maintain so uh, there's a lot of focus on these activities that i already mentioned maintain and share kdes traceability lock code source of the code traceability plan and we all have to work together as an industry so now let's look at another important definition, the traceability lot code or TLC. It means a descriptor, generally an alphanumeric descriptor that is used to create a unique identifier for the traceability lot with information about the, support, the source of the traceability lot code. So the traceability lot code is a number or a descriptor, generally numbers and letters, that allows you to identify a lot. How big is the lot? Well, you define that. The source of the traceability lot code is the point at which this code was assigned to a food. And it's important to remember, unlike many things we're used to, the rule says that you have to assign or the traceability lot codes are, dis are assigned in two places in the where it is transformed or where it is packed so it's important to have this reference for the traceability lot code to describe the source of the traceability lot code it's un we understand that sometimes uh, you don't want to provide information about your suppliers. So when do you have to assign a traceability lot code? Well, that's what we talked about on the last slide when you pack a raw agricultural product. So when you pack mangoes, you're going to assign a traceability lot code. Or when you transform the food product. So repacking when you condition the mango and you receive mangoes from two different suppliers and you repack the mangoes, let's say in a warehouse, you're a distributor, but you're also carrying out an activity that does require you to assign a traceability lot code. So these are some of the things that we really have to look at in more detail. But we're going to develop some tools to help you to understand these concepts better. When you don't have to establish a traceability lot code is when you participate in other activities. So let's say you're a warehouse and you send the product to another warehouse. That's just a transport activity or a shipping activity that does not require a traceability lot code. And in your traceability plan, you're going to have to describe how you assign the traceability lot codes. 
And something that's very important in the rule is that all of the key data elements have to be linked to the, to the traceability lock code. But what I'm interested in right now, what I want to make sure you understand is what is the rule? Who is subject to the rule? What are the critical tracking events? What are key data elements? What is a traceability lock code? in very general terms. So you can start working on getting this in place in the next three years. So the traceability lock code is very important. It may be the same throughout the supply chain unless you carry out some other activity that qualifies. So let's say I'm a packing house and I do the packing and I assign a lock code and then I sell the trailer to someone else. And then it goes into another trailer and then they take it out of the boxes and put it, put it in other boxes. So it's being repacked. So you are transforming the food by repacking it. So here we have another example of critical tracking events and key data elements. So this does not, this part doesn't exist in our supply chain, uh, but here we have some of the information that we have to collect and maintain. So let's see. So here we have, as we saw, the critical tracking event and the activities that are going to be performed. So here we have the traceability plan requirements. What do I have to maintain for foods on the food traceability list that you produce, harvest, pack, transform, or store? So you're going to have to have a description of the procedures so how and how you generate those records, a description of the procedures that you use to identify a food on the food traceability list, as well as a description of how you assign the traceability lock code to a food. So how did you create that number or that alphanumeric descriptor? That is all going to have to be contained in your traceability plan. So if you are subject to the rule, you're going to have to have a traceability plan. And in this traceability plan, you're going to describe how you carry out all of these activities related to the rule. For example, how do you assign the lot code if you're a packing house, for example, all of your key data elements. If you grow a food that's included on the list, you're going to have to have a map of the farm that shows where your growing areas are. It also has to have the location and the name of each field where you are growing foods, including geographic coordinates and any other information necessary that allows you to identify the location of each field or growing area, something like this. It doesn't have to be too sophisticated. It can even be hand-drawn. So how do I see this? Well, many farms have employees that harvest the food and the food, or rather the harvest requires certain key data elements. So you're going to have to have a traceability plan. You're going to have to have a map and you're going to have to have the key data elements for the harvest. And here, here the rule, and I don't want to get too complicated, but the rule indicates for each critical tra tracking event, it indicates what records you have to maintain and provide. So for harvest, there are things like the type of product, the variety, the quantity, 
the location where the product was harvested, the date of harvest, the name of the field, and some additional information. So, and this can be on paper in electronic format or any other format in writing. When you perform the initial packing, you're going to have to have key data elements as well. There will have to be information about the food product that arrives, the information about the packing and certain key data elements related to the shipping. If you, as a farm, do the initial packing, then you are also going to have to have key data elements for the shipping. So it just depends on our operations. So if you pack the food, if you do the initial packing, you're going to have to have a KDE. And so here, I'm going to show you another part of the rule that has to do with shipping or transportation. Also, when you receive product or transform the product. And here we have the whole chain. And it indicates here what key data elements you're going to have to have for each stage. So what are the elements that I'm going to have to have for receipt or for shipping? Well, you go back to this section of the rule and you can see what those key data elements are. And here we have this web page where it says, well, this is in English though, but it says, what the key data elements are for each stage in the chain for cooling, packing. And here we have the elements for initial packing. I only have two minutes. Uh, so you can put your questions in the Q&A while I'm finishing up. So here we have the key data elements that you must have as the initial packer the receipt, the processing, and the shipping. So these records have to be maintained on paper or in electronic format. Uh, they have to be provided in within 24 hours upon request, and they have to be maintained for two years. And if there's an outbreak, knock on wood, or a risk to public health, the FDA might ask you for an electronic, a searchable, uh, spreadsheet for a specific period of time, like an Excel spreadsheet. There are certain exceptions, cases in which you don't have to provide an Excel. This will come up if there's an outbreak or some public health risk. Let's hope not. But they will ask you for information. They will ask you to provide it in a searchable spreadsheet, but there are certain exceptions. And here we have an example of information that you might be asked for, or that a distribution center might be asked for. So what are the activities? What activities do we have for this year? We're going to develop communication tools. We're going to create a reference guide, a quick reference guide regarding the requirements of the rule something that will just be four or five pages with illustrations that will allow you to understand what we've been talking about here. And we're going to also produce a longer guide that will have more details and examples of how to do this in the mango supply chain with instructions and examples. And we're also going to develop some videos so that in two or three minutes, you can understand the concept of key data elements, or what is a critical tracking event, or what is a traceability lock code, or the things that the elements that your traceability plan must include. So this we'll be doing all of this in 2023. And with that, I would like to thank you. And I've left five minutes to answer some questions. Well, Dr. Nieto, thank you so much for your presentation very illuminating and we have time for a few questions. We have here, what transformation activities make it that the rule does not apply? Oh, that's a really good question. And uh, so I'm gonna go back to the rule here and I'm gonna read the definition of transformation. 
It says transformation is an event in the supply chain that involves manufacturing, processing of a food or changing of a food, also packing or it's packing. When the food is on the food traceability list, the transformation does not include initial packing. So that's the definition of transformation. Elizabeth, probably what you're referring to is, for example, if I make puree, let's look at this example. So if I take mangoes and I send it to someone or I sell it to someone who's going to make puree or jam, mango jam, they are applying an elimination step. When you apply an elimination step, the rule does not apply from that point forward. An elimination step of pathogens or organisms makes the rule not applicable from that point forward. So the the rule does not apply after elimination of pathogens. Any questions? But it's always important to read the definition contained in the rule because perhaps what I think is transformation may be different from the official definition. Yes, Leo. Yes, we have another question from Hector who is asking, it says, the traceability plan and the description of the traceability code is not the same. Uh, I saw that in a recent audit. No, no, it's not the same. You're, you're not seeing my screen anymore, right? No, we're, we don't see your screen. No, it's not the same. There's a definition of the traceability lock code. And something that's very interesting, many of the concepts included here are similar to the private standards, but for the purposes of the rule, they have a legal definition. So Hector, we're going to produce some videos which will explain what a traceability plan is for the rule and what traceability lot code means according to the rule. And you'll be able to compare that with those definitions in your private audit, which could be similar, but it may not be the same. The traceability plan is a written plan with written procedures of how you generate a traceability code or what the number means and how you code your farm or like when you put down the date of when the product was harvested. I hope that was clear. Yes, thank you, Dr. Nieto. Well, we're going to end the questions and answers there because we're short on time. But if you have any questions, please send us an email at the National Mango Board or directly to Dr. Sergio Nieto Montenegro. With that, we are going to conclude and we'd like to thank Dr. Sergio Nieto Montenegro again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you to the whole food safety team, CTS, and really I'm just the one here providing the information, but thank you to the National Mango Board and all of the attendees for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. We hope to see you at the next one.